Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome once again. Um, I want to talk to you today about several related topics. And it has to do, of course, with the closeness, the so very closeness of Jesus coming for his bride. And uh, so I, I want to discuss several things that may not initially seem like they are connected, but I think that you're going to see this. I'm going to talk about falling into temptation, why we need to avoid that, what Jesus tells us about that, and the rewards we can get for avoiding that. Um, can we do any of that on our own? Well, absolutely not. We're only going to be able to avoid it via being close to God. So that's what I'm hoping that we're going to talk about uh, some more. And I want to show you what I, I keep finding more and more three harvest groups and in different places, excuse me, where I wouldn't normally, where I hadn't seen them before. I, I guess that's it's just as I, I search deeply and deeply and deeply, I'm coming up with more and more of that, okay? And I'm going to show you a couple of more uh, that, uh, again, is related uh, to the closeness of where we are uh, in timing as far as the pre-tribulational harvest of the bride and the mid-tribulation harvest of the left-behind church and the final harvest of the remnant Jewish believers uh, and after that. Okay, so what I do is I start from this, this particular premise. I think that, that Jesus, through his words, hello, uh, Danilo, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here from Brazil. Everyone welcome her. Excellent. It's, so please come on in, everyone. Come on in. Caleb, Car uh, Carolyn, uh, Donna, glad to see you here as well. Ruben, thank you for joining us. Everyone else come in. We're going to start uh, by covering, as I mentioned those uh, before, there are three harvest rapture groups is what I contend. And, and what I see is that when you look at the plan of God from a distance, and as you are looking at a great distance, you can only see just the basic outline of what's in front of you, right? Oh, dear Sister Paula, thank you so much for being here. I hope this is going to be a blessing to you. Um, everyone, please, uh, Sister Paula, she's, she's so faithful in, in this instance, and I just so appreciate her so much. Um, I really, really do. And I can't wait until we all meet in the clouds with our Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh, and so this is, let's get back to what I was talking about, the three harvest groups. Now, the three harvest groups, why do we see them three? Uh, and what you'll find is that from the greatest distance, right, we couldn't see anything as far as a harvest or a rapture, right? And then through the dispensation of time, as we've gotten closer, then we see how, wait a minute, we've gotten closer, and then we see the outline, wait, we can see there is a rapture event. We can see it on the horizon, right? And then as we've gotten closer and closer to that, wait, we start seeing more detail. More revelation is given to us in the word. And we start seeing, wait a minute, there's not just one there. There's multiple ones there. And 
the word reveals that uh, as, as Holy Spirit continues to enlighten us with that up until the point now that what I see, and I, I, I'm, I just don't see it any other way. And of course, that's what I'm presenting, what I am being obedient to present, but I'm continuing, I'm continuing to find more. And I think it is very exciting because each, each type and shadow that I see in there related to Jesus calling up his bride, or ultimately then uh, by the mid-tribulation calling up his entire church, we can see that there are multiple ones. And then we see the plan of God in greater detail. 117, uh, it's 1017 right now as I just bang, look at the clock. 117, that's our separation. That's our division. That's right there. Amen. Uh, and so what I see in these is three, and more and more people, I believe, are seeing those as well. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to discuss that more. I think actually I can take a, a slight moment uh, to really kind of uh, flesh this out, just to kind of give you some uh, food for thought, okay? And such as uh, the group that has not seen it yet, okay? Those who have not seen it, they look at, well, let's say that they believe that there is a rapture event that's going to occur, okay? That group. And that rapture group what we see happening in that particular instance is um, we know the the base scriptures out of First uh, Corinthians uh, chapter fifteen and uh, or Second Corinthians, First Thessalonians chapter four. Uh, that's where I want to actually just kind of bring your attention to at the moment in the first uh, Thessalonians chapter four passage. And uh, that's uh, what uh, verses 13 through 17. And one of the things that I just want to draw your attention to is we see, we go like, okay, well, the apostle Paul, uh, he was giving uh, the revelation or revealing the mystery as was given to him by Jesus. And he tells us, behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Well, excuse me, that's the, the Corinthians version. But my point is, that those particular passages, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make the point where he is revealing this at this particular time. But taking the, the passage where he says, where he is revealing the mystery, he is including himself in the group. So in other words, at that very moment when he's revealing this, as was revealed to the Apostle Paul, he was saying that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, right? So in other words, what I'm saying, in, when you compare both of those passages, the Apostle Paul believed he was part of that, that he was actually going to be part of the living saints. And how, how can we say that? Because he included himself in the group. We who are alive and remain, he would, you know, I can just imagine him uh, motioning to himself, we who are alive and remain uh, shall be caught up together. Now, we know then that later on down uh, after his uh, three missionary journeys, then we see that he makes the realization that wait a minute, he's not going to be caught up alive. Uh, he's 
finished his race and he's about uh, to be um, to be killed, right? And he knows there's a crown that's laid up for him. He knows that he's still going to be part of it, but not as a living saint. Do you understand? That's that's what I'm saying. So even through the Apostle Paul, there was that same dispensational relief, uh, release of revelation, which was then imparted to us. Now, does that mean that that we can't look through there and see all of these things in the word? No, absolutely not. Of course we can. We know that uh, according to Amos 3, 7, that the Lord will do nothing except he reveals it first through his servants, the prophets, right? So everything in the plan of God is in his word, but he reveals it to us in his perfect timing. And that's, that's what we're going to discuss a little bit more about that. And then I want this to be an encouragement, brothers and sisters. I want this to be a great encouragement. There, there's uh, turmoil, there's ups and downs, there's, there's uh, people that, uh, that give words that others with itching ears just cling to and those types of things. There, uh, there are mockers, there are scoffers, there are false prophets, there are you know, wolves in sheep's clothing. We know that all of this is happening at the same time. Why? Because we're told in his word that it would be like that when he comes. So we can look at all of these things as evidence that he is at the door, as he says in the book of Luke. Okay? And, okay, so we're going to, let's start with a quick word of prayer before we get into the meat of this, because we got a lot of good stuff to cover. All right, dear Abba, we love you and we praise you, and we thank you so much for your precious son, Jesus, whom we lift up in praise and adoration and glory and worship. We just love you so deeply, Lord Jesus, and we so desire your coming, and we are looking up. We are lifting up our heads, and we're looking for your glorious appearing in the sky, and we know just how soon that is. I'm asking that you will just cover this message, the hearts, minds, and souls of everyone that's watching, watching right now with your precious blood, Lord Jesus, that it's going to protect us, it's going to cleanse us, it's going to prepare us to receive the glorious cleansing word that you have today. And that more might be saved in this moment because they still have a chance to become a part of the family before you show up in the sky. Amen. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. All right, so let's let, let's 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 just get into this. Let's start with what I want to talk about: falling into temptation. Now, it might seem a strange way to start, but you're going to see here very shortly that there's a lot of um, information that is so relevant here. So, actually, what I want to start first with. I want to read you a number of passages that deal with falling into temptation and what that really means uh, and, and how that relates to uh, the, the deeper part of our study here, how not to fall into temptation, what the reward is for, for persevering and passing the test through temptation, those types of things, okay? So let, let me, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read these in any particular order, but I've got a whole bunch of them. I encourage you to check them out on your own, but there are uh, several of them that we're going to cover in uh, deeper detail, and I'm just going to read them out. So let's, let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. <clears throat> Excuse me. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, 
and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. And I want to highlight on that word too, escape, right? That, that should really perk up your ears, okay? that you may be able to endure it. We are really going to cover that a little deeper. How about Matthew 26, verse 41? Watch and pray. You know how I am on that. Watch, guys. We got to watch. We got to pray. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Sometimes I, I look at, at, uh, at the passages of, of Scripture, and I think, like, if we fasted for 40 days, it seems a bit of an understatement to say, yeah, I bet you're pretty hungry, aren't you? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, you know, like, and he was hungry. No, really? Okay, yes. Uh, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Now, we're not going to read all of those. I'm going to stop there because the highlight of the point is Jesus was led into the wilderness specifically to be tempted, okay? And he overcame every temptation at that moment. We're, we're going to go into a little bit of it uh, later, uh, but I just want to highlight that part. He was purposely led to be tempted. We are to pray not to be led into temptation, right? Jesus already took care of that part for us. When we, when we go to him, that's, that's the deal. We go to Jesus we don't try to do anything on our own. It's all through Jesus. First Timothy 6, verse 9. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. James 1, verses 12 through 16. And we're going to read a large passage of James here a little later. But uh, just to kind of give you a little snippet here, a little hors d'oeuvre, as it were. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it was conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. All right? We're going to, like I said, we're going to read a, a deeper version of this as we go on, just the highlights. And we fill in these other ones, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, dealing with the armor of God, okay? Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having all done all to stand firm. 
Stand therefore, having fastened the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and so forth. The whole point here is when you're tempted, what do you want to do? What do we want to do as Christians? We want to put on that whole armor because that devil is going to come at us with everything that he can. And today, this day, as we look at this, he is coming at us like a bulldozer. But he will have no strength over us when we put on that full armor of God. Amen. Matthew 6, verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Romans 13, verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I hope you can see how these are fitting together. Hebrews 4, 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Galatians 6, verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. You really need that now, brothers and sisters. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Amen? All right. Uh, Luke 22, verse 46. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Luke 22, verse 40. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Luke 11, verse 4. And forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. James 1 verse 14, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And then the last one, Mark, so I can get the whole synoptic gospel in here. Mark chapter 14 verse 38. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. All right, so th that's going to be our, our uh, appetizers, as it were. And uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, attack on just a little bit uh, to what I had given in my last message. In my last message, I covered the three harvest groups that we can see in the Garden of Gethsemane scene that is uh, in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. And if you're not familiar with what the Synoptic Gospels are, those are the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they are considered parallel in that they cover uh, the, the same time frame, a lot of the same situations, and that sort of thing. So that's what we say when they are synoptic gospels. Uh, John is a gospel, but it's not synoptic. So th if you're unfamiliar with that, that's all we mean by that. A lot of times, that's where we can see that the synoptic gospels actually are written to the different audiences the pre-tribulation uh, bride audience, which is, which is um, the audience for the book of Luke, the left behind church in mass that is uh, the audience in the book of Mark, and then the remnant Jewish believers, of course, the, which is the audience for the book of Matthew, okay? And, uh, and, and there, right, if you have questions on that, I have many, many messages that cover that in, in deep detail. Uh, I think in the interest of time, since uh, there are, my messages tend to be long because they're, they're deep in the word anyway, I encourage you, if you're not familiar, check out those. Uh, and in fact, to check out the, the last one that I'm discussing here, 
I'm just going to highlight out of those three groups. Let's start with the book of Luke. And he starts uh, in Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. Uh, I'm just going to highlight what he says here at the beginning, at the end. So in Luke 22, verse 39, he says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Then after he goes out, he comes back and so forth down in uh, verse 46, he comes back, he finds them sleeping. He says, why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. All right. Now, I'm not going to go deeply into that. Like I said uh, in my previous message, I go into much deeper detail. I've got uh, some other information that I want to add to this. So uh, in Mark, the left behind church, what does it say here? Uh, it goes all the way down. It doesn't start. That's Mark 14 verses 32 through 42. What is interesting is that you do not find that it starts with them saying uh, anything about watching and praying for not being entered into temptation there, right? Uh, but what he does say is in verse 34, he says, stay here and keep watch. Interesting, right? But then down in verse uh, 37 and 38, he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for me uh, for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. So there we get that again. So the timing and the instances of these are what I'm trying to focus on. In Matthew, uh, this is chapter 26. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let, let me whip this whistle so I don't sound like a... 13 year old. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> All right. Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46. Now, in, in here, uh, he starts out, sit here while I go over there and pray. Once again, he doesn't start about praying about not being led into temptation, right? Big point. I want you to see this. Uh, okay. So then after he returns in verse 40, he found the disciples sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Okay. And so there's obviously that is a huge important part, but what it seems uh, that I see out of those is that Luke, written to the bride, is the only one that has taken it to heart from the beginning, right? They are the ones that are, are praying that they will not fall into temptation. Why do we see that? Because it harkens back to the previous chapter in Luke chapter 21, verse 36, which we hope you know, that says, Watch ye, therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are coming upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay? So they've already taken that to heart. He has told through the book of Luke to the bride, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Right? He withdraws, but the other ones are being caught asleep, right? They are being caught asleep. So they are not praying yet that they will not fall into temptation. They have already fallen asleep. All right, so that's great, Wayne, you, you say. So this is very interesting. What does it mean to fall into temptation? What point am I trying to make here? So I'm gonna read you out of an article that was written by a gentleman named John Owen. Uh, and, and he writes this uh, short article that I think covers this very well. 
<clears throat> and so I'm going to paraphrase it here, in which he points out that everyone in this life is tempted. Uh, and as long as you're in the body, temptation can reach you. The impulse to sin has a landing place in your life. Jesus doesn't say, watch and pray so that you won't be tempted. There is no way you can get into a place in the Christian life where you are no longer tempted. He says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Literally, it says, so that you will not enter into temptation. Uh, John Owen is helpful here. Entering into temptation, Owen says, has two distinctive features. First, Satan becomes more earnest than usual. There are times when he intensifies his assaults against you. Not every day in the Christian life is the same. Amen? There seems to be days and seasons of life when all hell breaks loose, and we should all be familiar with that. Paul refers to this when he says, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, that's what he's talking about there in Ephesians 6. Second, the heart is unable to escape the trap of temptation. Often you will be able to brush off temptations without serious difficulty. But there will also be times when a particular temptation will gain power and vigor within you. You will find yourself divided, wanting to reject the temptation, but at the same time unable to free yourself from it. Here's an illustration. Imagine a salesman knocking at your door. You open the door and he tells you what he is selling. At that point, if you're not interested, it's not hard to say, sorry, I'm not interested. Try the nice folks next door. But let's suppose that you invite this person into your home. Now he sits down in your living room and makes his presentation. He shows you the product. He talks to you about how much you need this and how much better your life will be if you have it. Some relationship begins to be formed and your mind and your heart become engaged. Now it's harder to say no. This is what it means to enter into temptation. You're engaged with it, connected to it. You let it inside and it's sitting in your living room. The temptation that landed in your flesh has found a place in your affections. Temptation grows in power as it builds a position in your soul. It's helpful to use an analogy of football. Now, we're, we're talking here about American football. So, uh, so for all of my Aussie compatriots, uh, of course, that's going to be a little different. But uh, you, you, you'll, find, you'll, you'll find the illustration uh, interesting. The game is about moving the ball forward and backwards, trying to gain yardage. You are building a position. It's the same in chess. The chess master builds a position on the board. Gradually, he moves his pieces into commanding positions on the board until your king suddenly gets knocked over. It's the same in business when there is a hostile takeover of a company. Gradually, over time, a position is built with the shares and with seats on the board and eventually their position becomes overwhelming and the takeover is irresistible. It's the same with warfare. The great military conflicts of history were won or lost by where the generals positioned their troops. The strategic pieces of high ground that they took and so on. This is true on the football field, in the boardroom and on the battlefield. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, Satan was building a position. He had entered into the heart of Judas, the betrayer. He was unleashing his entire arsenal. So our Lord Jesus comes to the disciples and says, watch and pray so that you will not enter into temptation. 
What Satan is doing here is going to trap you. Don't get into a place where sin traps you. This is a word for us. Temptations will come to you this week, and Jesus says, watch and pray so that what will come to you will not enter into you and trap you. Amen. Do you see that? I hope that you do. Uh, and uh, and so that's that's great. Okay, so we see that there is a battle, a battle for the mind, a battle against our flesh and uh, and those desires and those uh, things there. Uh, but how does then how how do we get that to temptation? How do we then get to uh, how do we get to the three groups and uh, and where that comes from? Okay, so I'm going to tie this over. And I'm going to read <laughs> another passage. I'm going to read out of Luke chapter 8. And that is dealing with the parable of the uh, sower. And I've covered that in a previous message before as well. But here is what I want to do. I, I, I want this to tie in to our patient endurance and times of testing. And what about times of temptation as it relates to tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble? And which people are kept from it and which people are going into it? Okay? All right. So I'm not going to read the whole thing uh, out of Luke chapter 8. I'm just going to read uh, the, this uh, parable of the sower <clears throat> and the answer to this. Uh, starting at verse 4. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it, and some fell upon a rock. I, I, I want to highlight that, that it doesn't fall on rocks, plural, it falls on a rock, okay? I want you to highlight that. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Water of life, cleansing of the water of the word. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit and hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They, they're unsaved, right? Uh, they on the rock are they, when, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in a time of temptation fall away. All right, highlight that. Let me read that again. I, I really want to make it a, a strong point of this passage. This is Luke 8, verse 13. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believed, and in a time of temptation 
fall away, fall into temptation. And they which fell among the thorns are they which, when they have heard, so they have heard, they did have ears to hear, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Now, did it say that they brought forth no fruit? No, it didn't. It said they brought no fruit to perfection. It wasn't fully perfected fruit, okay? But they that on good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keepeth it and bringeth forth fruit with patience. Now, I want to stop here and I want to uh, point something out. This, uh, I, I'm wondering if we are new, uh, not seeing uh, uh, the three harvest groups in Jesus's response. And, uh, and so uh, what I am positing right now is that we are dealing with four groups the unsaved, the uh, Jewish remnant, and uh, or the Matthew group. Let me just put it that way, right? The Matthew group. And uh, uh, they which fall among the thorns are the Mark group. But they which fall on good ground that bring forth fruit, fruit with patience are the Luke group. Now, let me cover this. Why do I say this? Why do I say this? Okay, first I want to point out something. Well, we know that uh, the word that's taken out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Okay, so they're not saved, right? They, they, they've heard the words, but they aren't saved, right? They haven't uh, had the word sink into their heart. That it hasn't grown. What's interesting, as I pointed out in Luke chapter 8, verse 13, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. Now, when I, I wanted to go ahead and show you this so that you can see it in the Greek, I want to, I want to highlight something here for you. So if you can take a snapshot of that. Okay? All right. So this this is what I want to highlight they. They that they on the rock. They on the rock. Now the Greek word for rock there is petros. A rock, a ledge, a cliff, a cave, stony ground, famine of the same as Petros, a rock. Now, what we see is that, uh, that depending upon which translation you uh, get this in, you can see that that has fallen on stony ground. Well, I, I, I'm wanting you to consider something different here, that if the word is Petrus, right? It is a rock. Peter, Simon Peter, as we were just discussing in there, the word was said to Peter, why are you sleeping, right? Peter is a stone, a rock. And, and so uh, I am thinking like, uh, it's very interesting. There's a time of testing. They fell into temptation, right? I, I really think that there is something there. I'm hoping that you will uh, consider that as well, okay? So that would be the Matthew group, okay? So then why, if we, if you just follow me for, uh, with this particular thought in mind, I find it very interesting. If verse 14 then is the Mark group, what is the Mark group? That is the left behind church, right? And why? That's the uh, the church that is, you know, they they believe, right? And but they are 
stuck in the world. They've got things to do, right? We've got to build uh, and uh, you know build churches. We've got to do things. Uh, we've got to watch our families. We've got all of these kinds of things, right? Worldly pursuits that maybe in and of themselves are not bad at all, but they are more important than watching and praying not to be led into temptation, right? Let's read that verse again. And they which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth. So in other words, they start their walk. They start their walk and uh, they fell among thorns. And it, it, it just harkened back to me in Genesis after the earth was cursed. And the earth then brings forth thorns and thistles, right? And so in other words, what this is telling me is that this is the world, right? They which fell among those that are in the world. They've heard it. They've gone forth. They've begun their Christian walk. And then they are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. And that is what I'm saying is one of the reasons why the church as a whole is left behind because they are, they, they are focused on the cares of the world, the riches, the pleasures of this life, all of these things rather than bearing the fruit that God is wanting to, uh, to grow in their life, okay? That would be the Mark group. And then 15, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bringeth forth fruit with patience. OK. All right. And I am saying that is our Luke group. So do I have anything that would show us any more that that is, in fact, the case? Well, I think so. And I'm going to show it to you right now. And that's out of the book of Revelation, chapter three. Now, out of this, I'm going to be reading uh, from, uh, I just want to highlight a few things. Uh, I've got the whole chapter here, but I want to read specifically uh, about the letter to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3. And then we're going to cover some deeper detail on it. Okay, so let's start at verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, 
and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, I, I want to uh, highlight a few things here. Now, I'm hoping that several of you have already picked up on a lot of the buzzwords that, and I'm not using that in a pejorative sense, of course, that several of the words that I asked to highlight through all of the scripture that we've done so far, for you to uh, be able to keep that in mind, I'm sure you have heard several of them in this passage. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to look at a little uh, that I want you to consider. First off, this is a letter to the church in Philadelphia, okay? Now, it says it's to the church individual. But I want you to, to also contrast this with what the very last thing is, which is what he says in every instance uh, in, uh, with all of the letters that he's talking here. He says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, plural. So in other words, there is a letter that's for each individual church, but all of the letters which make up all of the church are there for our instruction, right? That's why we can get something. We don't get rid of it. We learn from it. We use the examples that are uh, portrayed in it. We, we recognize the illustrations. We, we recognize what's going to happen in that instance is something we don't want to have happen in our instance. So we want to uh, place ourselves, as it were, or to identify where we are within the church body. All right. Now, secondly, I want to point out another thing. Okay. This is, this is for, I, got, I really want to stir up the hornet's nest of people dealing with works. Now, first off, is salvation by works? No, absolutely, positively, unequivocally, no. You are saved by grace through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I haven't made that clear, please go back and read that scripture for yourself. Salvation is by grace through faith alone, not of works. Having said that, once you are saved, you are saved unto good works, right? So we would expect that there is going to be fruit that's going to come from that once you are saved. And that harkens back to what we were saying back in the parable of the sower, that, uh, that the Mark group, again, I will highlight that, uh, and they which fell among thorns are they which they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. It does not say brings forth no fruit. It just say it's not perfected fruit. Okay, I want to highlight that. The reason why in all the letters to the churches here, what is the first thing that he typically says? I know your works, right? So there's an expectation that we get from Jesus that there will be works that will follow your salvation, right? And that's what we're wanting to be able to point out here. Now, in this instance, he knows the Philadelphia works. And I, I think uh, the, there is definitely one work uh, that, that we know that it is that God wants you to do before that leads to your salvation, to believe on him whom Jesus has sent. What is that out of uh, John chapter 26? But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the works that follow you 
after you are saved. And so having looked at that, what we're dealing with in the churches, are we dealing with saved people? Yes. But are all of these saved people going to go in one single rapture harvest event? The answer to that is no. And there's a reason for that. And it is, it, this is why we see it when you look at it in so many instances, okay? Why then is it that this one church, the church of brotherly love, the church of Philadelphia, why is it that they are kept from this hour? I'm, I'm going to highlight this again, okay? I know thy works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, right? That's an open door. Jesus opens that door right? There's an open door that's going to happen. When, when that trumpet sounds, there's an open door that's going to be in the clouds, and we are going to go up in there. Amen? That is what that open door is, and it's opened by Jesus, not by any person. You're not going to be able to go there by your own effort, right? Jesus is going to be the one that's taking you, all right? But there are things that you do, right? There are things that you do. You want to grow in patient endurance. This is what it says. I, I know thy works have set before you an open door, no man can shut, uh, and uh, for thou hast a little strength, and has kept my work, word, and has not denied my name. And this is very interesting. What is this harking back to? Do we know anyone who has denied his name? Well, we know that Peter did, denied him three times, right? And uh, if, if and I believe that we also have Peter is representative of the Matthew group, the, uh, the, the group of uh, Jewish believers, okay? So that's what we're going to say. Now, let, let me point out, so in verse 10, uh, Revelation 3, verse 10, excuse me, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Now, what this says in the Amplified, which is from the Greek, right, it translates that, that as my command to persevere. And this is one of the things that I'm trying to hopefully be so encouraging to our brothers and sisters that it's this patient perseverance that is leading us to this point that we are now ready to be called up. Don't turn away. Don't let any man steal your crown. Let's keep looking up. Are we that close? Oh, yes. Uh, there's, uh, there's, if, if, if you want to I'm, I'm just trying to say, keep looking up. He's about to call us up any moment, okay? But he says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of temptation that shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So, here we go back to that temptation. Why are we supposed to pray that we enter not into temptation? Well, I'm going to tell you why. So I believe it's because we want to pray to be part of the bride. We want to pray to be in the, the pre-tribulation group. And that pre-tribulation group is told they're the only group this, this church is the only church that said that they're going to be kept from that hour. Now, it's very interesting and it's very important to know that it says that there is a specific time frame for this event that's going to occur. And what this church is being told is that they are being kept from that time period, right? Now, does it say that... Uh, that, uh, that we as Christians were not going to uh, suffer periods of, of 
of tribulation. No, it's just that the Luke group, the pre-tribulation bridal group, is the one that has willingly accepted this because we love Jesus. That, oh my goodness, that's, that's what I would want to say. And let me, let me say it another way. And so are we saying, am I saying that the, the left behind church doesn't love Jesus? No, nope, I'm not. What I am saying is that the left behind church loves the world more than Jesus. And that is the difference, okay? They are choked by the cares of this world, its riches and the pleasures thereof. All right. So I want to get into this because that, there was the point here uh, that where it says in verse 11, Behold, I come quickly, hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. All right, let's, let's, let's go. And, and another thing that I would point out, I've done another message on the three harvest groups. Let me just make a, a, a point, just a little pointer to that. That's one of the few videos that I've done. So you can look back on them in which I cover the three rapture harvest groups in Revelation chapter three. And what three groups do we see? We see Sardis, we see Philadelphia, and we see Laodicea, okay? And I encourage you to go back and check that. That goes in very deep detail um, as to why that's the case. And I don't, I don't want to take up more time than that here, so you can go by and check that out. Just a little, uh, a little perk up the ears to let you know that that's the case. Uh, all right. What I want to go to uh, now is James chapter 1, the testing of your faith. Having, you know, testing, passing the test, enduring under testing, right? All right. I want to read you out of James chapter 1. And, and so what I want to do... Um, I'm going to read the, the just part of this. Uh, I think probably down through verse 18, okay? James chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. <clears throat> All right. And then we're going to talk about it. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 Hebrew tribes. Now, I'm reading this out of the Amplified Bible because I think that there are uh, certain things that we need to pull out from the Greek uh, that I think is going to be helpful to you as well. All right to the 12 Hebrew tribes scattered abroad amongst the Gentiles in the dispersions. Greetings, rejoice. Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. And let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through a decision or circumstance, he is to ask of our benevolent God who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to him. But he must ask for wisdom in faith without doubting God's willingness to help. For the one who doubts is like a billowing surge of the sea that is blown about and tossed by the wind. For such a person ought not to think or expect that he will receive anything at all from the Lord, being a double-minded man, 
unstable and restless in all his ways, in everything he thinks, feels, or decides. Let the brother in humble circumstances glory in his high position as a born-again believer called to the true riches of to be an heir of God, and the rich man is to glory in being humbled by trials revealing human frailty, knowing true riches are found in the grace of God. For like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass. Its flower falls off and its beauty fades away. So too will the rich man in the midst of his pursuits fade away. Now highlight verse 12, blessed, happy, spiritually prosperous, favored by God is the man who is steadfast under trial and perseveres, ding, 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 when tempted, ding, ding, ding. For when he has passed the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For temptation does not originate from God, but from our own flaws. For God cannot be tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is dragged away, enticed, and baited to commit sin by his own worldly desire, lust, or passion. Then when the illicit desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin has run its course, it gives birth to death. Do not be misled, my brothers and sisters. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, the creator and sustainer of the heavens, in whom there is no variation, no rising or setting, or shadow cast by his turning, for he is perfect and never changes. It was of his own will that he gave us birth as his children by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits, ding, 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 of his creatures, a prime example of what he created to be set apart to himself, sanctified, made holy for his divine purposes. All right. Now, that's the passage I want to read out of there. And there are a couple of things that I would like to point out here. Thank you all. All right. And that is, you can see that there are trials and temptations. And when he passes the test, he's approved. So it's, it's a testing thing. And we know that there is no test that we encounter. There's no temptation that we encounter by where we are not given a means of escape, right? So that we will pass that test. There's always a means of escape, always, right? And that is, that is how we pass that test. But I like what it's saying. Now, here's one of the things I want to point out here, because we're going to start talking about rewards. And uh, those rewards, <clears throat> what each different one is, and how those rewards relate to the different harvest groups, okay? There's, there's going to be those things. So it's interesting when we're, we're looking here at the book of James. And, uh, and so who is the audience that we're discussing here? It's to the 12 Hebrew tribes scattered amongst the Gentiles. It's written to Jews, right? And uh, so I, I think it's interesting here when, you, when we go through all of this, and I encourage you to check this out. Read the word. Get in the word. Read it for yourselves. Let Pray for that wisdom and understanding, and let God give you that wisdom and understanding yourself, all right? All right, so here's what he says. 
Blessed, happy, spiritually prosperous, and favored of God is the man who is steadfast under trial and perseveres when tempted. For when he has passed the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life. All right. Now, cross-reference that with what we see here in, uh, uh, in Revelation chapter 3, talking about the church at Philadelphia. He says, uh, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of temptation that shall come to it come upon all the world to try them that dwell in the earth. Ooh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, so we see two things going on here, right? So we can see, I, I, I'm hoping that you see, here's my, uh, here's my submission to you, is that we see two different groups here. Why? Hmm, well, I'll tell you why. Because he's actually talking to the, uh, the tribes there. And, uh, and it, it's interesting that what we're talking about in verse 12, James chapter 1, verse 12, is it says, Blessed is the man who is steadfast under trial when tempted for when he has passed the test and been approved. What does that mean? This person hasn't passed any test yet. This person has not passed the test. All right. So, uh, but what's different here is, wait a minute. Here, the Church of Philadelphia, it says, because you have kept my command to persevere. Wait a minute. That group has passed a test, you see? I want you to try to see this here. There's, there's these different things. How can you see these different things? And here's another one, okay? Take away, behold, I come quickly, hold thou fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. But here in James, to this Hebrew group, they are looking at once they pass the test of receiving a crown of life. Now, what I want to do for this uh, moment is I am going to discuss crowns, and they are rewards. Okay, let's discuss the five crowns that exist. All right? Okay. The five crowns, and I got this out, just out of uh, Wikipedia, and, and I think it's a, it's a good little synopsis here. Uh, for me to kind of give this to you. The five crowns, also known as the five heavenly crowns, is a concept in Christian theology that pertains to various biblical references to the righteous's eventual reception of a crown. Sorry, it's starting to get a little tongue tied there. After the last judgment. The proponents of this concept interpret these passages as specifying five separate crowns, these being the crown of life, the incorruptible crown, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, and the crown of exaltation. In the Greek language, Stephanos is the word for crown and is translated as such in the Bible, especially in versions descending from the King James Version. These five rewards can be earned by believers, according to the New Testament, as rewards for faithfulness in life. And uh, so there's a, a reference to that. So let's discuss what these five crowns are. Now, we discussed in James chapter 1, they were discussing a crown of life. Now, that's why I'm saying, like, I want you to listen to this. The crown of life is also called the martyr's crown. It's referred to in James 1, verse 12, that's the ones that I told you, and Revelation 2, verse 10. It is bestowed upon, quote, those who persevere under trials. But remember, again, I showed you that the Philadelphia church has persevered already, you see, and so they are kept from that. 
So what happens then? The, the sleepy church goes into the, uh, the time of Jacob's troubles during that first part, okay? And, uh, and they will have the opportunity to be able to win their crown. So they are not going to have that uh, other crown necessarily because, well, they lost that particular crown. We'll go into that in a minute. And that is the crown of righteousness. But they have a chance to be able to get that martyr's crown that's going to happen during the uh, uh, time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week, okay? As our tribulation period, if you want to call it that, the, the, the seven-year time frame for which is going to encompass both the mid-trib and the post-trib harvest, okay? I'm just gonna leave it at that. It's going to fit within that seven year time frame. All right, the next crown, uh, uh, or, or, hold on, let me finish. Uh, it's bestowed upon those who persevere under trials. Jesus references this crown when he tells the church in Smyrna to not be afraid of what you are about to suffer be faithful even unto the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. There we are. That's the second mention. The incorruptible crown is also known as the imperishable crown and is referred to in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25. This epistle, written by Paul, deems this crown imperishable in order to contrast it with the temporal awards Paul's contemporaries pursued. It is therefore given to those individuals who demonstrate self-denial and perseverance. The crown of righteousness, yes. The crown of righteousness is mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, and is promised to those who, quote, love and anticipate the coming of Christ. These Christians desire intimacy with God, okay? And that's why I'm saying that uh, the uh, Apostle Paul, he's talking about uh, getting this one. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 here in just a minute, uh, and we're going to go into some deeper detail, and we're going to see another three groups in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Hold on to your hats on that one, okay? Desire intimacy with God. Now, do you do you notice this is this is very interesting? Desire intimacy with God. It's not saying that about the other crowns. Do you desire intimacy with God? I pray that you do. I do so desperately desire that. Constantly, overwhelmingly desire intimacy with my Lord and Savior, my Jesus, my beloved. Yes, 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 I desire that intimacy, and I pray that you will desire that intimacy too. Pray that prayer. Pray to be intimate, uh, to, to desire that intimacy, to develop that relationship, that intimate closeness, and, uh, and then ask God to answer that prayer. Amen? All right. The next crown, the crown of glory. The crown of glory is discussed in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, and is granted to Christian clergy who, quote, shepherd the flock in unselfish love, being a good example to others. Oh, that's 1 Peter 5, verses 2 through 4. My goodness. Crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing is also known as the crown of exaltation or the crown of auxiliary. Delineated in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19, and Philippians 4, verse 1, it is given to people who engage in evangelism of those outside the Christian church. In the New Testament, Paul earns this crown after winning the Thessalonians to faith in Jesus. All of these crowns, I want to highlight again, these are rewards. And what I'm also doing is I'm also tying, since there are, as I contend, three harvest rapture groups, 
there are going to be at least three separate crowns that each of those particular group members would be able to receive. And, uh, and actually you can, you can get more than one crown, certainly. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and so I've, I've wondered about, uh, the, the crowns that, that I will receive and, and I so look forward to them to be able to, to cast them at, at Jesus feet, because he's the one who, who, who did it all. He's the one who does all of this, but, uh, but each reward is also relates to, I think, a particular place in, um, uh, in your harvest order. All right. So let, let, let me read you then out of second Timothy, Timothy chapter four. Uh, and I am going to read you the first, uh, 12 verses. Okay. And then we're going to cover this a, a little bit more. Uh, this, this is actually very deep where you find some of this stuff. Okay. Second Timothy chapter four, starting at verse one, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come today, 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 when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Where do we have that departure? Hmm. All right. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also that love is appearing. Now, let me stop here for just a moment. He tells you who the people are that get this crown. He is not saying like, okay, everybody gets crap. Okay, let's get line up everybody. That's okay. Yeah, if you got to get, what about you? Ah, back there, I'll toss you a crown. It does not work that way. There are crowns that are rewards for faithfulness in service, right? As a believer. So they're available to all, but just like running the race, only the winners win the crowns, right? And he's used that in Philippians to be able to kind of give you the difference. But he's showing here for the crown of righteousness that those are the ones that love his appearing. If you don't love his appearing, you're not getting this crown. And that crown is what I'm telling you is associated with the pre-tribulation harvest. That is a reward, not a part of salvation that comes with a package. I know that there are those that, that really hate to hear this because they just don't want to have to work for anything. Uh, everything should be so simple. I don't know about you, but uh, Jesus said to pick up your cross and carry it daily that does not make things simple in this life. But you have to be willing to do that. You have to be willing to die to yourself. And that takes an effort. 
You can't do it alone. It's, it's the Holy Spirit that does it in you, but you need to do this. You can't just like sit on the sidelines and assume that that is going to be the case, okay? There are three harvests. Now, are all of the people involved in those harvests, are they saved? And my answer to you is yes. But the order that you go in is not a salvation issue. It is a reward issue. Now, remember, I, I hearken back to what I said previously in talking about uh, in, in talking about the Apostle Paul, who originally thought that he that the 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 rapture of the living saints uh, would occur, you know, at at the time that he was uh, uh, revealing the mystery to the church, and with him saying, "We who are alive and remain," he's not just speaking in the third person, just to say, "I'll oh, casually include myself in the group." No, he would say, if, if he didn't know or think that he was that, wouldn't you have thought that what he would have said is, all of those who are alive and remain at that time, they will be caught up into the air. No, he doesn't say that. He says, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, right? So what I'm trying to say is that he thought that that was going to be for him, but he finds out that later he's going to be one of those. He's going to get that crown of righteousness for that intimacy. So is he part of the bride? Yes, but he's going to be one of those that are the dead in Christ that will rise first. And I hope that you see that. Uh, thank you, Allah. All right, now, Having discussed uh, the five crowns, I want to continue on and read you what I am saying also shows the three harvest groups. And that's just in the next few verses, verses 9 through 12. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed under Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tisitus, uh, have I sent to Ephesus? Uh, Tychicus. I, I'm having a tongue tie problem today. Tychicus. Uh, and here's what I'm saying. In those verses, we have the three harvest groups. Why? Why do I say that? Because now we have, with an understanding of this, uh, which I, I hope that I've been able to show, that Paul is an example of then the dead in Christ that are going to rise up. And so he says, do your diligence to come shortly unto me. And I think that's where he's he's talking about that. He's alluding then to who's going to come with him. Now, here in verse uh, 10, uh, I'm saying that uh, that is dealing with the left behind church. And that is the same thing that we'll see from the, the letter to the church of Laodicea, okay, the lukewarm church. Uh, that goes back to the the church that, uh, or excuse me, the group that uh, is choked by the cares and the pleasures of this world. Uh, and, and so what do we see in this? For Demoth has forsaken me, having loved this present world, 
and is departed under Thessalonica. Now, here's what I want to point out to you. Do you know what the word Demas means in English? It means popular. Hmm. Think about that. What group of people are, are we that are so self-absorbed, so selfie-involved that, that Demas, oh, you want to be popular with everyone. We want to go along with everyone here. Don't get in that, that group that, that says that you have to like be intimate with Jesus, that says that you have to love him. That's not important. So what do we see here? That is the left behind church. So he, he was with Paul, the apostle Paul, but he's left and gone back to the world because he loved it, right? He's popular and he wants to be popular, right? And that's what I see out of that. So let's look at verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Well, I mentioned before, who is Luke? That's the bride, right? The bride is with the Apostle Paul, right? The bride, the, those that are alive and remain are caught up together with those that are the dead in Christ are in the clouds. Remember, the Apostle Paul is the representative of that now in this example. So Luke is the only one that's with him. So Luke is the only one that is the bride. And that's what he says there in, in uh, verse 11. Only Luke is with me. But then what does he say? Take Mark, who is next, right? Who is left. That's the example of the uh, sleepy church, right? And bring him with me for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And, and, and what do we see this? I, I see the same example. It, just out of verse 11, it harkens back to me to 2 Kings chapter 2 and the rapture of Elijah. And then who is left behind? It's Elisha. And he sees him go up. But then the mantle of the ministry falls from Elijah to Elisha. What do we see here? Take Mark and bring him with me, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Okay? Then we've got verse 12. And you think, like, okay, Wayne, that sounds good. But what about verse 12? Uh, and Tisicus, uh, Tisicus. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. Uh, this gentleman. <laughs> Tychicus, there we go. Have I sent to Ephesus? Now here's someone else that's being sent here. Do you know what uh, Tychicus actually means? In English, what the definition is, it means chance. Now what I want to do here is I'm going to read you a little bit here from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia on, on Tychicus, okay? And this is very interesting, and you're going to see why I say that this shows the Jewish remnant, right? All right, and this is why. Uh, Tychicus is mentioned five times in the New Testament, and he's called an Asiatic Christian, or he's an Asiatic Christian, a friend and companion of the Apostle Paul. In the first of the passages, his name occurs as one of a company of the friends of Paul. Friends of the bridegroom. Interesting. The apostle, at the close of his third ministry journey, was returning from Greece through Macedonia into Asia with a view to go to Jerusalem. This journey proved to be the last which he made before his apprehension and imprisonment. It was felt both by himself and by his friends that this journey was a specifically, especially a, a important one. He was on his way to Jerusalem 
bound in the spirit, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 22. But another cause which gave it particular importance was that he and his friends were carrying the money which had been collected for several years previous in the churches of the Gentiles for the help of the poor members of the church in Jerusalem. All right. And uh, uh, so no fewer than eight of his intimate friends accompanied him into Asia. And one of these described uh, was uh, Tychicus, who Luke uses the word Asian to describe Tychicus. He was with Paul at Troas and evidently journeyed with him as one of Paul's company all the way to Jerusalem. And so that's what I'm wanting to point out is what we can see in this tiny little thing is the, uh, the several verses, once again, that show the three harvest groups. And, and when you start to put all these together, we can see in each of these instances, one, what do we know? We know that there is a pre-tribulational harvest. There is a mid-tribulational harvest. We can quibble about to, timing is about when that is just for ease and simplicity. Let's call it the mid-tribulational harvest. And then there is a post-tribulational harvest as well. We know that there are dead in Christ in all three instances. We know that there are living saints in, uh, uh, in all three instances. We, uh, we know that they are harvested, are raptured at different times, but they all follow the same process that the Apostle Paul gives us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There's a lot to go in there, but what does that mean for us now? Right now, brothers and sisters, Jesus is about to call up his bride, the pre-tribulation harvest. And I am wanting to encourage you. I'm wanting to encourage you right now that he is that closed. Don't be discouraged. Don't be turned away or aside. Be looking up. That's what he says in Luke. When you begin to see these things come to pass, and we just see everything, things are happening every single day all over the place, but don't look to the world. That just lets you know what is about to happen. You need to look up because Jesus is about to call up his bride. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I, I, I love you. I truly do. I truly do. And I, I, I want us to pray uh, for all of our brothers and sisters. I pray that, that everyone is, is strong in the faith. I, I pray for everyone that is going to yet come into the family because there's more that's going to come in. I pray that you understand and, are, and that have peace in your heart because you know that God has everything under control. Nothing happens outside of his will, plan, and purpose. Amen? All right. So let's plan on that. Oh, my goodness. I, I, just, I just want you to, to, to hold on to that because it's going to happen any moment now. And, uh, and that's really what I've got for you. If, if you don't know Jesus, oh, my goodness, this is your chance. And it's going to be one of the last chances. But you can... You can receive his free gift of salvation right now. How do you do that? Well, you have to say yes to Christ. You have to believe the gospel. And what is the gospel? We get that out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And that tells us that, that, uh, that Jesus as God, he came down in flesh and he died on a cross for our sin debt that you couldn't pay, only he could because he was the only sinless person who ever lived. 
You're not sinless. I'm not sinless. None of us are sinless. But we can receive our imputed righteousness from him by receiving that gift. He died on that cross. He was buried in the grave for three days. And after three days, he arose to life out of that grave. And he offers his free gift to you. All you have to do is say yes. Believe and trust in with all of your heart that Jesus did, that he is God, that he died for your sins, that you then, that you believe that he was raised from the dead, that you then receive, you want to know that Jesus, the love of Jesus, the love of God, you want to be cleansed, you want to be cleaned, you want to be with him. And if you do that, and you've done that now, then I say, welcome to the family. Listen up. Listen for that trumpet sound. It's about to sound any moment now. God bless you, brothers and sisters and new family members. I hope to see you in the clouds very soon now. Maranatha.